So you folks look like serious runners here. Is this part of the Maydoc? I've got more Maydoc uh, marathon photos coming up. That is Maydoc. Tell us about this. So we did, which year was it? 2014. 14. 2014. 2014. That's, oh. that's, a different, that's a different run, that's actually, funny enough. Um, there's so many occasions in which we dress in very silly attire to run races, Natalie, which we'll have oh, to talk you to. that's great. But the first one was the Medoc in 2014. That was our first big one. Yeah. Okay. So was, um, the Medoc Marathon, which is, uh, for anybody who may, I'm, I'm presume not everybody's familiar with it but it's around Bordeaux's vineyards um yes. and it's it's a full marathon um but we were I was very unlucky I'm not going to make this a very long story <laughs> I I we we got to France the day before uh we stayed overnight had supper and clearly something didn't agree with me in oh, my supper ouch. and uh I started running and thought oh this is not good um and so I I was unwell <laughs> oh, oh. for the entire course of the marathon and it was 30 degrees heat it was so hot so, um, yeah, so, so this was me well us crossing the finishing line Peter was unbelievably kind we trained so hard for this and I was being abysmal when we were you know hopeless <laughs> And he stayed with me instead of going on and, and getting a good time. He did stay with me, which was above sport. and beyond the call of duty. Well, what I love about that is, you know, she runs about three times. She runs like the wind. She runs. <laughs> so so for me to have to say, oh, no, don't worry. Honestly, I'll stay with you. Uh, was like, oh, thank the Lord. You know, for, I can, for once I can keep up with her. But no, we did, we did this in 2014. And we did it in memory of a, a great friend of ours, Michael Cox, uh, who was head of Wines of Chile in the UK and had a, a, a long career in the wine trade. He very, very sadly died of cancer shortly before this and um his wife lynn was a was a great long distance runner so we thought well, why don't we do a positive thing with lynn um and we got and a whole team of team people. of runners it was, it was from brilliant. chile ah, and yeah. all over were very kind and we raised about sixteen thousand yeah, pounds in the end lot, yeah. for wow. uh for charity as a result of this but it was it was great fun we, we had a really good laugh we had the best glass of wine um Rodera, I think, Rode. uh, oh no, I see what you well, mean. Yes, yeah, yeah, Rodera afterwards. But we had a great glass of wine at Lafitte, but the, the <gasps> ice cream. Lafitte. Oh my goodness, Lafitte. Well, yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. You, you sort of have some at the at the. At not, the station. They're not so. serving Lafitte exactly. Okay. So you stop so at each chateau with, to honestly, have. Honestly, with, with the Medoc Marathon, there's there's oysters, there's steak. <sighs> There's, you know, wine everywhere. Completely and you, inappropriate. Oh. The only thing that was good, the glass at Lafitte was okay, but the cheap chocolate ice cream at mile 28 or whatever it was, no, it was the last, last was stop. just the best so, uh, literally about. a kilometer before you finished was an ice cream and i've never enjoyed an ice cream more in my entire <laughs> life oh, that's great oh well, wow. i think if you offered so, susie a bottle of lafitte and, and another one of those ice creams <laughs> at that stage she would have taken the ice cream i'd have gone for the ice cream it's terrific well lorna one of um uh, the folks on social media and uh, who actually contributes to my site was asking she's a marathon runner too and she's was asking me how did they manage to run this with wine and ice cream and she said i i couldn't make it like my stomach would be so upset you know that you do well, i mean funnily funnily enough we have very different approaches to running because we we have we haven't we don't we're not crazy serious runners but we it's probably our form of exercise and we tend to do runs um sort of half marathons and things you know this was this so this was uh, there's a picture here of peter dressed as richard the lionheart he loves fancy dress <laughs> That's More great. Do, uh, <laughs> running around the vineyards of Denby's in Dorking, so English vineyard, and they every year have what they call the Bacchus half marathon. There is a marathon, but it's basically the half run twice so it, it's more of a half so marathon. this is the same that's one. me yeah, yeah. doing it in a rather silly outfit as well it's great. Um, and uh and it's just a brilliant brilliant half marathon but again it's wine all the way every time you stop this in fact there are no loos but there is wine everywhere <laughs> <laughs> one toilet on the entire course and about oh my 20 goodness. wine stops. A Mine's thing. a diuretic or a diuretic, is it? Yeah, it yeah, flushes the system. Anyway, well, wow. It does, it? It does but you're but also, it, you know, you're sweating. You're dirty yeah. running. So there, there is yeah. an optimum. Honestly, I can talk you through the medics of it. But, the medics but, of it. But what I was going to say was I'm always the killjoy about these things and I just like to get running and run and talk. Is it Laura who was talking about this? You know, I don't tend to stop for wine or food or anything um and whereas peter is brilliant and stops everywhere <laughs> has a glass of wine at every station has his food has a chat and just enjoys the run which i think is really the spirit in which you are supposed to do these and, things. I, and I and i think my guru in this logic is uh, henri lurton of brand cantonac who, who sponsored we were part of the brand cantonac team in the medoc marathon i remember sitting next to him the night before the Medoc Marathon and he trying to convince me in that beautiful Gallic way that obviously you know actually it was 
better to drink wine round a marathon than not drink wine. And I, and I was not <laughs> believing any of this. But then I did the Medoc Marathon and I thought, well, OK. And actually, uh, there was a chap who we met up um, afterwards with from the British wine trade. who was about 20 years older than us. He'd done it in half the time we had. And he drank in all the stops. Oh, so I thought wow. maybe there's something in this. So I, at the Bacchus half marathon since I've definitely tried that theory and there's something to it Natalie I don't know what it is but you definitely have to be in fancy dress and this is the key okay everyone misses this bit but um, even if it's a serious long run wear fancy dress because that gets you out of everything everyone says gosh that's a really bad time but if you were wearing that that's amazing um, <laughs> it's so, true so everyone's nice to you and you can drink and no one worries about your time so the key tell Laura is just fancy dress Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, <laughs> I walked the Bordeaux or the Madoc Marathon once. I'm not a runner at all. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I was dressed as a Canadian, I guess. But um, first, these these eight uh, guys, you know, each holding a this massive wedding cake and one guy was at the top. So they were carrying him. So they passed me and, I'm, you know, and all these people in mega fancy dress and I'm, you know, optimized for being cool. And then finally, I, I the last straw was when this elderly woman uh, was pushing a catheter and she <laughs> she sort of crawled or walked up past me. I thought, oh, my God, I'm just I'm not made for a marathon. So anyway, I, feel I shouldn't really be laughing at that, but it is too <laughs> well, she was in better shape. <laughs> yeah, that is amazing. I mean, the Medoc Marathon was it was eye opening, isn't it? In that sense, firstly, for how much the French clearly relish dressing up and especially how much French men like dressing up like racy women. Yes, there's a uh, lot of ballerinas, a lot of mustaches is, yes, and ballerinas. Yes. Very <laughs> intriguing. I think that needs exploring somehow in national <laughs> psychology. It's program. a different podcast, yeah. <laughs> but also, just, you, know, you, 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 you just sit up and on a sort of more serious point, we're so used to the Medoc being and Bordeaux being very straight laced, very buttoned up, very smart, very serious. True. And you go for the Medoc Marathon and you look around and, and you're on the quay in uh, the quayside in Poyac, you know, the headquarters of serious Bordeaux. And, you know, there are gigantic stages with samba dancers and 10,000 people dressed like idiots and, and have just having a great time in a wine part of the world. And you think, yeah, you know, this is this is good. We should never lose sight of this. Wine is about enjoyment. It's about fun. And, and this kind of thing and getting together is just exactly the kind of thing that wine should be doing. And it's exactly the kind of thing that Bordeaux needs to do, particularly. Absolutely, I agree. And is this Medoc as well, where you're Santa's? This you're... is, this is yeah. funnily enough. I mean, it's, this is a little one. It's in Winchester, where we live. Um, and they do, which is where we live. And it's okay. the uh, Santa fun run. And it's just a 5K <laughs> that everybody does with their kids. And it's in the beginning of December, is it? I'm trying to think when it is. And it's in, anyway, it's in aid of um, a local charity, um, which is uh, yeah. the Naomi House, it's called. Um, and so it's just a really lovely, fun, fun run around Winchester. And I think oh, there's. And we all dress as Santa. That, so you, you get a, a Santa suit and you run. Um, and I, I can't see there, but I think I'm with one or two of the kids. Um, and it's just yeah, it's just it's just good fun. fun. And as you can see, I make a really bad Santa. <laughs> I think you've lost your beard. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> and this is the Winchester Festival that we're looking at now. I love the uh, little um tattoos or whatever that you put on your face and definitely uh, the fun atmosphere now you had to move this online due to covid this year how did that work yeah so so the wine festival we started 2014 it's a, it's an annual festival that takes place at the end of november um, and winchester's lucky winchester is, is the historic capital of england it's a very very ancient city it's beautiful lovely <laughs> to visit at christmas we have the most wonderful christmas market and ice rink and the cathedral's just magical um so every year but we have we have one of the buildings we have is, is the guild hall and the photo that you've got up now is of the guild hall we have these wonderful large spaces historic beautiful perfect place to have a wine festival and especially in winter you need it to be uh indoors in a nice place the the, the photo before you showed was actually at a, a summer festival which we did which was a bit of a spin-off but the, ah, the, the thing's okay. always so the that's, same that's um that's that was another person's uh, another festival in winchester that Got we it. took a bar from we took a wine you know, festival, a wine wine festival bar. bar but it's um, always the same the, yeah, the idea is have the, fun the big one's the festival in in november yeah. and and it was yeah last year we just 
couldn't believe that you know we couldn't do it it's it was it's one of those strange feelings isn't it you think mm. we're not going to be able to do this and we've done it for five or six years now every year and we've built up this lovely following of people who almost feel like they own it now going back to what we were saying before about people walking in on the first time we ever did it and not having a clue what to do now they all walk in and they've done it and they know what they're doing and they're bringing um, a minibus they, with their friends yeah, they, and family you know? so that's really but then we couldn't do it so we thought we needed or we personally had the choice either we do nothing or we try and make something happen that gives people something to look forward to and a bit of fun and we knew it wasn't going to be the same it's never going to be the same as getting everybody together for the festival but we we were determined that we would do something and we did you know mm. so it, we took it online it was it was successful so that was lovely yeah, yeah um, and it, um, it, you know it got, we got lots of people joining in on it and um, i mean essentially what we did was we got um we asked all our exhibitors if they wanted to do their own master class they videoed a master class and then we played it all out live on the day we had one big day um and we had sort of people doing um all sorts of different things so they, they videoed themselves all over the country whether it's bristol or oxford or wherever you know and it was and then obviously the people watching they could have ordered the wines in advance to taste along so okay. it, was, it was something completely different a completely different model but you know we're all getting used to slightly different things now aren't we and, and what's That's interesting true. is how many of these will stick obviously some of these are really positive things they're great things um the fact we can probably travel a bit less and talk to winemakers in new zealand and have a tasting with them is is is, is fantastic there's still nothing though that substitutes that really replaces the joy of getting together uh, as susie was saying the people at the festival it almost feels like family now it's a, mm. it's a kind of 2000 strong family so it's not the same but it but we uh, you know equally there's a value in, in being positive and making things happen and bringing a smile to people's faces and helping frankly also our exhibitors sell some wine so you know we had everything from Quinta de Naval Port to Louis Jade Burgundy to Razzaris loads of uh, English wines chili, lots of English wines you know and, and people could taste along and 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 you know we actually um, had more participation than we could have had at the real event um, because obviously that's limited by numbers and, and venue capacity, capacity yeah. uh, right. we have more people logging on which was fantastic and obviously there's still the videos are still up online oh they can um, still watch them people can still so go they can, to people can still yeah it's on the website is thewinefestival.co.uk okay. um, and we've, we've still got the new ones up so the master the online masterclasses they're sort of 25 minute masterclasses they're still up there so you can go and check them out they're quite fun um, but yeah who knows where this will go I, hopefully things will be back to normal soon um if not you know maybe there's a hybrid model that, that yes. we can all adopt but um i, I think that's yeah, great I think everybody's learning all the time aren't they really with um, definitely the whole, um situation i think you know covid has been an accelerant that has in particular moved the wine industry ahead a decade mm. in terms of technology and online so uh, in some ways it's been good but of course we don't wish for all the uh the other no. the negatives and uh, and so on so let's I love this little photo album that I have here. Okay, so you're both speakers. Uh, there's that's Oz, is that Oz? That's Oz. That's Oz, Oz. Clark. This okay. is um, at one of the uh, the one of the lunches for the um, Wine GB Awards. Um, <gasps> so uh, I'm chair of the Wine GB Awards, um, and Oz is a co-chair. And so this was a lunch in Wimbledon at Canizaro House where we were announcing all the award-winning wines. So it's a it's a fantastic competition. I absolutely love it. Um, <laughs> going back though to the whole situation last year um, and that continues, we normally would you know, um, judge this in London with probably a dozen tasters and it's all, you know, sort of 300 English wines, whether sparkling still, whatever. Uh, and this year, obviously we couldn't do that because we couldn't get people together in London and that number of people. So it ended up, and this was one of my positives from last year, that we did it at a winery in uh, in Sussex called Ashling Park, hmm. uh, which is beautiful and it was just three judges Oz myself and our, our uh, colleague and friend Rebecca Palmer from Corny and Barrow and uh, and we had a week of all just judging wines in what was effectively like an aircraft hangar oh, wow. but an open open fronted one and the weather was stunning I mean she sold um, it to me as a hard-working <laughs> it, 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 like, it was basically it was a holiday beautiful moments on the a, Riviera in a, in a difficult year yeah, she even had a personalized porter loop I did a personal you had your own toilet <laughs> I'm going to translate for North America here but wow yeah, sorry yeah, yeah no no that's fine one of those, one of one those, of those uh, mobile 
the, the, the builders yeah. have, but yeah. it had Susie Barry MW on uh, <laughs> a little Natalie star expects, as well. <laughs> expects the same no. treatment now, Natalie. You know, so where's my where's my personal where's life my toilet? Personal toilet? <laughs> yes, exactly. Why not? And Peter, you've also been a speaker at various events. Yeah, as absolutely. Well, I mean, it's, leading tastings. I think, you do the same, Natalie. I think that that buzz we all get as wine communicators from um, being with people and 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 talking with them and enjoying wine and raising a glass together and hearing people's questions and trying to help them, uh, hearing people's concerns, hearing when they when they don't like wines and their complaints. You know, this is all this. It, it, it's what makes wine human. It what's it's what I think gets us most excited um, as wine communicators. There's nothing like the buzz of a live crowd and and, yes. and 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 having fun with wine, is there? No, exactly. And the wine, it's fun because uh, you know all your jo jokes start to land near the end of the evening or maybe midway through, depending on how much they're consuming. Thank yeah, you goodness. can force people to laugh at your jokes. Uh, but that, <laughs> exactly. that one was actually funny enough on Riviera. We've we've done a lot yeah. of consultancy for various oh. different people, and that was on a Riviera wine cruise. So you oh, were nice. we were cruising, I think, from memory serves along the Rhine, mm. um, and you've got those amazing, as you know, the steep terraces of the Rhine mm. with the vineyards on. And you're tasting the wine that's coming from these vineyards as you cruise along in a boat. It doesn't get more magical. Beautiful. <laughs> oh my goodness. And that uh, this is at is, home. This oh, is this is at home. Okay. I didn't wasn't sure if that was BBC yeah. or not, but <laughs> no, that's that's been filmed for I can't remember what that was for. Yeah, actually, that was with part of a consultancy as well. Oh, that was part, yes, yeah. yes. So okay. We, we, okay. We tend to use our home quite a lot, given we don't actually live in London, we we often use our home for um shoots and photography stuff like that this is okay. our wine blast uh, this is wine blast here we go let's get the title up there yeah wow. that's great i love the photos of you too you guys wow. really interact off each other um but yeah you've done so well with when did you launch your podcast so it had been about two years in the thinking natalie i don't know how okay. long you took to to it takes a lot to get to that point doesn't it of it actually does launching. it really Heavens, does uh, you know you know what it takes and i think often people don't quite understand what goes into a, a, a proper podcast um, but anyway so we'd been thinking about it for about two years and we'd we'd got to the point I think it was when lockdown happened in March last year we were sort of ready to launch in about May we, we knew what we were going to be doing we had sort of six episodes planned we'd recorded a couple of them and we were ready to launch in May and as soon as lockdown happened we just kind of went this is crazy. We just need to get launched. Get on with it <laughs> while people are at home, while we've got time to actually put towards it. And right, so we right. did it in, in April last year. And a lot of the first episodes of Wine Blast were to do with uh, talking to people in all sorts of parts of the world, but about their situation given lockdown, right. and given the virus. Um. Uh, so what, whether it was a winemaker or a wine retailer or whoever. So we did these sort of little shorts of, of those kind of people. Um, and we kind of put the real wine blast slightly on, on hold. Um, and obviously we're back back with that now. Yeah. But it was, um, yeah, we, we kind of launched in tandem with the pandemic, I'm afraid. It, was, it was <laughs> yeah. an, um, wasn't, you know, but, but it was fun because, you know, you, we were trying to, again, trying to make something positive happen. Yes. Um, and uh, although it was funny, wasn't it? Because, you you know, we're positive newbies compared to you, Natalie. You've been going since 2018, I think. Is that right? Oh, what yeah, yeah. I'm ancient. <laughs> no, you're not ancient, no, but no, you're, you're, just you're, you're, you're a brilliant job. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's, you know, it is definitely, it was something that, you know, we've been lucky enough to do lots of broadcasting work uh, like you have. So we've been lucky enough to do lots of telly and um, and filming and 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 radio as well. But we definitely, for us, you know, when we finished Sat at a Kitchen after twelve years of, of of doing lots of TV, we thought actually let's try and use this time to explore things that we're passionate about. And we definitely felt that radio or podcasting was a medium that suited wine so well. Um, you know, as you've said, it's it's a very intimate medium. It's it's where you need trust. You need to use your imagination. And I think. TV can be a bit passive. You sit there and you receive the images and it's therefore hard to make wine come across. Whereas with podcasting and radio, you can, you're can you already using those those mental powers of imagination um, to uh, and being such an intimate medium to, to kind of be there with the host. So we thought this is something we've wanted to do for a while. So yeah, Susie said we took a while to, to sort of build up to it, but in the end it kind of went. And then suddenly, we, you know, it's been the most wild, crazy ride and it's been so fun. Um, and as you know, you know, we're doing this, this is, podcasting we find so collaborative um and and wine is collaborative and and you put that together with podcasting it, it feels podcasting's like collaborative in a way that i've never experienced before mm. though you mm -hmm. know you've, you've 
you know people come to you like you coming to us and saying let's let's uh, you know you we go on your show you you'd like to come on our show which is fantastic and um, I, I think I've never experienced that not yeah. not even just in wine but in any thing <laughs> I've ever worked in people genuinely want each other's podcasts to do well and yes. that's the spirit you do it in and you think that's so refreshing and yes. really lovely that's right um, it's not a zero-sum game the rising tide lifts all the boats because the more we can make that, wine lovers yeah. aware that podcasts are a great way to learn about wine the better for all of us because as yeah, you know yeah. we were talking earlier just before we hit record people listen to more than one podcast so they've got a playlist so mm, a collaboration absolutely. makes so much sense make it all about wine <laughs> yeah and, and, and because it's so intimate it's so um personal that each of us has our own style of talking about wine and there's so many different ways to learn about wine to communicate about wine to listen to wine to enjoy wine that absolutely there's there's room for those different styles and i think that you know it still it seems like early days as well in podcasting doesn't it podcasting is growing absolutely massively. oh yes there's i don't know what the stats are but there's i don't know 30 million or billion blogs but there's there's less than a million podcasts all all subjects but if you look at those that are still active, it's it's more like maybe two or three hundred thousand. It's mm -hmm. it's in its infancy still. I mean, yes. And if you look right. at other stats, um, most people finish either like seventy five percent or more of a podcast that can be thirty minutes to an hour. So there, it, the engagement is unlike anything you see on social media. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's an interesting because podcasting almost feels like an extension of social media in a funny way. It's true. But at the same time, the rules are very different and, and, and it feels much more wholesome. It feels more positive. It feels more supportive and collaborative. Um, and it, it feels it's a, there's a sense of community, isn't it, between... Yes you as the presenter and your audience um of course you're, you're recording this i mean we're lucky we got both of us in the house so we're doing that but you know you feel you can feel a bit isolated and when you do tv you definitely feel like you're one side of the screen and your audience you're on the other with podcasting that that sort of division blurs doesn't it and it and the feedback you know we're all lucky enough to get um it's a wonderful conversation it's like being in this big extended community mm. and family where you're all sharing stuff and sometimes people might disagree with what you're saying and they'll say it and or they might do the opposite and say something nice but either way it just feels like this ongoing conversation which is it's, it's so lovely and with wine you need that because there is never that sort of set hard and fast this is it gone done it's always wine is a conversation and 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 podcasts tap into that beautifully and brilliantly and i think that's why it's so exciting Absolutely. Let me see. I think the last picture. Oh, yes. So I want to mention this right now again. Here's your wonderful book on English wine um, that uh, our viewers and listeners um, can win. Um, so we have the book on English wine. We have the polishing cloth, the linen polishing cloth. And of course, that cheeky apron. Uh, do you like it fresh and racy? So <laughs> I'll put all the details in the comments. Um, whether you're listening to this on the podcast or, or live on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. But basically, just tag us um, and tell us what wine you're enjoying lately. Uh, bonus points if you tag some wine-loving friends and um, tag us and use the hashtags WineBlast and Natacans. So um, let's talk just a little bit about English wine, um, because we're not as familiar with it here in North America. Give us a sense of the scope or the size of English wine and what's happening lately. Well, I mean, I, I you know, I should let you you handle this, but I'm going to go. I've got to, I, I have uh, boned up on a few figures, but it's it, it, the, the key thing to say is it's it's so exciting. It's it? um, you know, wine things really happen fast in the world of wine, do they? So to see the category of English and Welsh wine emerge like it has done over the past decade not much more with the quality it has and the excitement and the diversity has been thrilling you know because this is for wine is a world which moves slowly it's one harvest a year it's hard to really you know have have a, a an entire category emerge from virtually nothing and take the wine world by storm which i think is what english and welsh wine is mm. is doing mm. so the vineyards quadrupled since the year 2000 it's now about three and a half thousand hectares which is it's in the global scheme of things it's nothing it's, it's 0.1% of the global vineyard um it's about 10% of champagne's vineyard for example yeah. um production is still it's two thirds sparkling wine so sparkling wine is the main thing that we do um and production has averaged in the last 5 years about 7 and a half million bottles but but it is it's sort of funny when you say it averages because we went from something <laughs> like 5ish million to 
14 million in 2018 and then you go back down a bit so I mean it's extreme because we have such a kind of marginal climate you know if you get a great vintage it's a whopper but mostly you know it's not so actually that seven is a strange average if you know what I mean because most years are not that average at all um, was, but, but yeah, I think probably we'll we'll end up in the next few years depending on how good the harvests are I mean around about 10 probably won't we 10 million bottles yes ish. and and you know again you, you say champagne's what 300 million isn't it mm. well this year it's a average less, but no, production or releases yeah. so you know it's okay. it's it's uh it's a yeah. very very small category still but it's interesting because you know exports are really starting to grow and i think that producers see this as a really good target it's about 10 percent of production at the moment is exported which is not very much but it's a lot more than, than what it was, it was. and okay. interestingly enough um you know the top market i think is denmark but beyond that the second and third markets tied in in, in second place are the us and canada so wow. uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're that the does get exported does come your way so i'm sure you know you can find these things um, so i guess it, and, and what people might look out for are traditional methods sparkling wines definitely okay um, they tend as a, as a terribly broad generalization they have an incredible acidity to them but it's a very specific style of really beautifully tangy acidity and then i always think they have a kind of an an orchard character you know um mm. sort of an apples and pears in the summer afternoon kind of feel that you that seems very english mm. um so there's a and they are very high quality i mean obviously then within that you've got your blanc de blanc you've got blonde noir you've got non-vintage you've got prestige cuvee so the, there's rosé obviously um so there's everything i think that that is still where we do the best job there are then people entering the market with more kind of um, Charmat methods sort of sparkling wines and very uh, intriguing packaging. But then also the, 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 the area that is really coming to the fore and seeing some real interest are the still wines because we've had, a, you know, some good harvests. So right. if England is hot enough, then we get some great opportunities to make still wines in every colour. Certainly the, the, the Chardonnays are looking Chardonnays, um, world class. Yeah. Uh, Pinot Noir is starting to really shine as well. So And some lovely rosé. And some lovely rosé and some even some sweets. I mean, funnily enough, there are parallels you could draw between some areas of, of Canada as well. Um, Don't think we'll ever beat Canada's sweet wines. No. We're not. We're not doing ice wine particularly <laughs> we, well yet. But we no, won't I mean, send you, know, you all our cold. <laughs> yeah, it's a trade off. You know, but, you know, all these areas where I think we're pushing the the the, the, the climatic extremes. Yes. Um, you know, but cool climate, cool climate winemaking is so exciting. You know, and I think it is. It's edgy. Days, it's nervy and edgy. edgy. Yeah. You yeah, get that yeah. extended growing season. There's often an intensity to the wines mm -hmm. um, because of that extended growing season that is really, really interesting. And I think that these days we're looking for wines that are more refreshing and more gastronomic and lower in alcohol. And th yes. this, these kind of areas like England, like Canada, is, is what certain areas of Canada, it's hard to generalise, isn't it? Is what, um, what uh, can be delivered by these, these, these kind of areas. And, and that's exciting. Absolutely. And do you, um, I loved uh, Susie's description of... Um, English sparkling wines, what would, how would you differentiate them from champagne? Because people make comparisons all the time because you're so mm. close, but also the limestone soils, that sort yeah. of thing, the, the dominance of sparkling, but how would you differentiate them for uh, consumers? It's very, it's very difficult to generalize a differentiation. Yes. And I think particularly now, Natalie, I mean, there may have been in the part, recent past, it might have been easier to differentiate them but I think the quality of English wines now sparkling wines is on such a par with champagne mm. it kind of depends who makes them okay. so you might be saying well, like we might know somebody who makes an incredible sort of barrel aged and uh, top quality grapes and lees aging for ages so they've got a very rich style of fizz we might know somebody else in England who is making the crispest, most aperitif style um, in a very lean and taut kind of way. So it, it, I think it is hard to say there's a definite, I know that's English and I know that's champagne, but I would come back to the style of the acidity and um, would be the big thing for me that you, it's, it's spine tingling in a great English sparkling wine. It almost teeters on too much, but when they're just at the right side of too much and they're not too much, it, it's really mm, thrilling. Mm, mm. Having said that, a great champagne is something that you just relax into. You feel it's so self-assured. You know, the, the experience is there mm. to make something that you feel so confident yeah. about drinking. There, there can be an element of sort of um, rusticity. Is going to sound wrong. It, uh, 
it is an element of of unbridled intensity sometimes to to English fizz, which can be good and bad. Um, and I think it's partly, as we've said, you know, the the the, inten the intensity of the acidity, you know, which is which is like biting into a beautiful Cox's apple or something, you know, from a cool climate. Um, but allied to this very very long growing season because it's cooler. Um, and also very low yield. So I think if you look at the average yield in the UK, it's much, so much lower champagne, than yeah. champagne. Yeah. Sure. The, the combination of all of those factors means you get an intensity in the wines. And sometimes that can be too much. Um, but there is often that kind of edgy energy to a lot of English wines, which, which you can just slightly pick out. Champagne will often have... That the edges will be smoothed over it will be much more self-assured and polished whereas the english wine will often just be you know that that kind of unruly New child the in the block. corner which is <laughs> slightly misbehaving but also just yes. really interesting yeah yeah absolutely oh my goodness i could uh, there's so much more i want to cover but let's just touch briefly on the master of wine program because you're both masters of wine first time you've passed it uh, on the first try which most people don't um so t talk to us um, a bit about um what it is for people who don't know what this program is and why the pass rate is so low. You said yourselves, more people have been to outer space than who have, uh, who are MWs, which is, I love that comparison. So, so what Lightly is- crazy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so- Well, space, 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 is, uh, space is pretty crowded these days. <laughs> actually, so, you know, it's true. Yeah. Well, with Elon Those Musk, he'll be wanting to do an MW. No, no, no. <laughs> if I mean, he gets his way. It's, yes, yes, it's a low pass rate. Um, I think the Institute is trying really hard to, to get that pass rate up um, mm -hmm. without compromising standards, you know, and I think that if um, the value of the MW is, I think that not just what you learn, even though that's massive, because I think uh, in wine, it's quite easy to think, you know, I get it, I understand it, but there's always more things to learn. So I think what the MW teaches you is to be humble and to sort of say, I'm never going to know it all um, and be aware of the limitations of what you know. It teaches you to question everything, ask questions, questions, mm. questions. Um, okay. which I definitely learned from from doing it you know just ask you know if somebody says well we use that clone um because well no we use clone so and so so and so and so and so why right because it gives us a better yield why does it give you a better yield you know you know, so keep asking the questions which I always use take an answer and go okay great lovely and wrote it down but now you know I wouldn't do that I would go no I don't I don't understand I need to know a bit more and a bit more it makes you really question everything I think also just um, an analytical uh, mindset to everything um mm -hmm. quantifying quali qualitative as well it's 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 a it's a way of thinking and i think that often you don't know you, that that kind of instruction is going to help you but it really really does and i think that um so it's a it's a way of thinking about yourself and about a wine which is tremendously healthy and positive um it, it's it's um it's a life-changing experience and and i think that it's difficult to sum it up in one package as to why yeah, good, why it helps doing a good but job yeah. But, but going, I mean, going back to why it's so difficult to pass, I mean, I think um, a lot of people, it's a lot of study. And if people are working full time, that's really hard to give enough time to the study. And it's not only a lot of study, it's a lot of study of lots of different areas. So for anybody listening who, who's not familiar, you have to sit a paper on viticulture and vinification and business of wine and contemporary issues. You have to taste, take three tasting papers, one on white wines, one on red wines, one on whatever that you know it could be a mixed bag um and those are all blind you then have to pass a, well, i think it's a research paper now isn't it? it used to be a dissertation it's a research paper so there's so many elements to it <laughs> that you have to invest an awful lot of money time energy um sacrifice family life perhaps mm. i think this makes it all very difficult it's not just that the what you're doing is difficult it's everything around it that that makes it very hard and i think therefore getting a a, a high pass rate is unlikely to ever happen i think it will mm. go up but um but it's never going to be in really high mm. and i think i think it's not yeah as we said it's not about saying i know everything about wine it's quite the opposite it's it's realizing your limitations and saying i'm open to that but how do i learn effectively and how more importantly can i help others because a lot of the mw program is about 
altruism is about helping other people you, this code of conduct you sign up to is is i will do this properly and i have a responsibility um and we all take that very seriously so you mentor other people through the program um and, and help them if they have difficulties uh, it is a distance learning program so so it's not you're not sort of super hands-on but there is that wonderful feeling of, of being able to help other people we uh, for 10 years after we finished ran a master of wine student boot camp so we we sort of tutored people came to winchester uh, it wasn't us who called it a boot camp it was to christen that by some of the students uh, we were just we were actually just we didn't want to, we, we were asked to do it by some students we'd studied with who hadn't got through um and it was terrifying because we had to stand up in front of probably some of the best tasters in the world and supposedly tutor them and it wasn't really us tutoring them it was us working with them to work out the best strategies to, to get to help them get the best out of themselves and that we found tremendously rewarding and that's what we tried to keep going with um that's what we feel a responsibility beholden on us um as mws is to help other people and that, and that can be you know helping a master of wine student to helping the person on the street who just wants your help he doesn't really care about it, just wants a recommendation of something they can enjoy that's really simple and and that you know actually that's something we should they say though you know, mm. when we were studying the master of wine we were given so much yeah. help by people and you think that is incredible you know people's time and energy and I was blown away really yeah, um, by yeah. the generosity of, of certain people that, that helped us pass really and I think that that's one of the things we talked about not being afraid to make mistakes earlier as being mm -hmm. a good teaching method well it's the same you learn doing the MW forces you to learn to ask for help and that really puts you in good stead i think in the wine world because we all need to help each other uh, you can't just be doing stuff by yourself this is a collaborative ende endeavor and um and and that sort of really helps cement that understanding oh that's wonderful i love that um just a couple but we would sorry sorry to interrupt nothing yes go ahead anyone listening is thinking of doing the mw we would recommend it from the rooftops it is okay. the most fantastic journey of discovery about yourself about wine um and, and we would absolutely the one mm. thing you have to do is just make sure you have enough time to devote right. to it um but it's just one of the of the magical ways of really discovering wine and we were on the course with with quite a few people who weren't in the wine trade at all uh, lawyers architects and they were just doing it for the love of wine and <laughs> they were know, mad. it was just um you know <laughs> So, so if anyone's out there, think you're doing it, get in touch if they want to. But if not, come on, just just think, you know, this is an option. It it's great fun. Oh, wow. That's great. Great encouragement. Um, and so just a couple uh, last questions. If you could share a bottle of wine with anyone in the world, living or dead, who would that be? I don't know if it'd be the same or different for each of you, but uh, who'd be at the table? It'll definitely be different for each of us. <laughs> <thank you. laughs> okay. So that is red. Um, uh, so you should see the kind of books that he reads and I read, Natalie. <laughs> yeah. mm, okay. <laughs> I, um, I did think a little bit about this. I know you were you were talked about potentially asking us, and do you know? I, I know this is this is a really random choice, but I'd I'd love to sit down and share a bottle of wine with Kristen Scott Thomas because oh. I just think she's the most. Oh, beautiful, um, intriguing, I think, I imagine very intelligent. I think she's a fantastic actress. Yes. But she's got, she sort of flies under the radar and I I just think she's amazing. And I so liked I her in The English Patient, she was brilliant. Yes, yes, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, just sitting in and being able to ask her things, it would be amazing. And I know it's, it's not an obvious choice, but um, oh, yes, I, like I, often, I, I think she's fabulous. Wonderful. Yeah, so, so I'm sense. going to have to do something to contrast with that. But uh, <laughs> I'm just reading the final instalment in the Hilary Mantel trilogy, actually. Oh. So Henry VIII, what, what an option for a man from history, if I'm thinking history. But uh, talking about people mm -hmm. from history who like their wine, uh, so we'd have something to talk about. Alexander the Great, how cool would that be? Uh, he definitely <laughs> liked his drink, didn't he? Um, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, you yeah. know, someone like that. You know, some of these people from history, Jefferson you think, Bottles, you know, you who clearly him. took an interest mm. in food and drink, um, who would be just fascinating to talk to. I don't know, some, some someone like that. But oh. it's an endless question because there'd be so many people, really, when you start thinking about it, aren't there? That'd be quite a rowdy dinner table party. It just sounds like <laughs> Henry VIII and Kristen Scott Thomas. <laughs> Kristen and I would be quietly in the corner. Enjoying our glasses. We'd be eyeing her as a new wife. <laughs> yes, 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 exactly. Yeah. How would she end up? Who knows? Uh, we'd have to keep Alexander the Great and Henry VIII apart, I think. So the sea chip ban would be true. would be a difficult one. Carefully yeah. monitored. Now, no, Kristen Scott Thomas, she'd never lose her head though. Sorry. No. Uh, anyway, <laughs> and if last one, if you could be a bottle of wine, any type of wine, not a bottle, but any type of wine, what would you choose? 
Oh my goodness me. Well, you'd have to be. I'd be champagne. You'd be champagne. champagne. I really would. Yeah. Why is that? I'd, you just, it's such, it's, bubbles make me happy. Yes. I, I, I feel like I'd want to be overflowing with happy bubbles. <laughs> it, that would be, that would be my life. If I could, if I could do that every day and I don't, I'm, I'm, it's a lesson to myself. It's a note to myself. Be more effervescent, be happier, be more bubbly. Um, because, you know, why not? Life's short. Mm -hmm. It is, it is. And we're not promised tomorrow. How about you, Peter? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I would be an increasingly full-bodied red. Uh, <laughs> that's the way my life seems to be going, Natalie. So um, I don't know. I'd like to think I could carry off being something like a Brunello, um, which I know is a special, special kind of wine for you. Um, yes. Your first amazing wine, Epiphanies, was Brunello, wasn't it? So I've been thinking yes, about that. You. Brunello or a Barbaresco or a Barolo, but I'd probably be more a kind of Shiraz that's kind of going a little bit loose around the edges, a little bit, a <laughs> little bit, you know, over mature now, a bit tired. <laughs> Sounds like yeah. something you could watch with The Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. That's all I need to be. <laughs> that's great. Is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to mention um, as we oh. wrap up? I don't think so. You've been so, so <laughs> lovely asking us so many lovely questions. Oh, you guys, I, I could I could go on for another couple hours. Uh, but anyway, it's it's terrific talking with you. Now, tell us where we can get in touch with you online. Well, um, I think probably social media is probably the best place. So okay. uh, on Instagram, we're Susie and Peter. Uh, Twitter, I'm Wine Schools and she's Susie Barry. They're probably the best places to get hold of us. But other than that, we have our website, which is su susieandpeter.com. Yeah, or, or, oh, the, or the podcast, you know, uh, podcast? If, you listen to, if you listen to Wine Blast, yeah. then, then you can get in touch with us through that as well. Uh, we've even got that, that wonderful, the magic of speak pipe, that little oh. button you can press and people yeah. can ping their messages across, which we recently discovered and got very excited by. So <laughs> if anyone wants to send us voice messages, hopefully nothing. So too on, angry. This is, this is on, uh, on the podcast page of our website. There's a little orange button, that, then you can yeah. just um, send us a message, which That's is uh, we love to get. Yeah, yeah. That is great. I'm going to post all of these contacts and your websites um, in uh, the comments here on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, but also in the show notes for the podcast, so people will know uh, how to connect with you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Well, thank you, Susie Peter. This was a great conversation. I just loved it. I love your energy and your passion. And um, I'm, I'm so pleased that more people will know about what you do, who you are, and, and get to connect with you now. You're very kind. Thank you so much indeed for thank all of you. this. It's been, it's been such fun. Oh, absolutely. Okay, take care and bye for now. Bye. <laughs>